clarity of the message um, this week because forgiveness is so important. How many of you guys struggle with forgiveness? Uh, anyway, um, so you struggle with forgiveness. You know, it, it is a hard thing. I, I was thinking a lot about f- forgiveness, unforgiveness, and like, I mean, there are some people who do things that are so horrific. How could we ever forgive? You know, and I started thinking, well, maybe forgiveness is um, is not supposed to be an emotional discipline, but it's supposed to be spiritual discipline. So we're going to talk about that today because as long as you have unforgiveness in your life, you have an open door to the enemy to destroy and, and, and just bring chaos to your life. So we want to make sure that uh, we have um, a healthy body, and this is just one way um, to make sure that that happens. So I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the power of forgiveness. Um, you know, that is, you know, you might have had someone who has done something to you that has uh, caused you to hurt or to have pain, um, sort of like this relational conflict that happens. And, and I would even go as far to say maybe someone that you know has, has caused pain and hurt to someone that you love. You know, that's even worse sometimes for wives as they take offenses for their husbands when someone hurts their husband, right? Maybe this isn't um, for you this morning. Maybe you don't have um, problems like this, but maybe you have a friend who does, right? So this message this morning then is for your, your friend, and this is how you can minister to your your friend, because I know that you guys are very forgiving uh, people and don't hold grudges, right? How many of you just, you're just, you're a grudge holder? Got one, got two. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm seeing most of your hands go up. All right, so this is, this is a spot on message then. Okay, so uh, a couple of points of clarification, though, before we get into um, the scriptures. Uh, number one, I feel like that it's, it's important to tell you that forgiveness is not condoning. You know, a lot of people think that, well, if I forgive them, then I'm going to admit that, or I'm gonna, it's going to be like it's okay what they did, or it, they were right in what they did. But that's different. The condone is different than forgiveness. You got it? Condoning and forgiveness, two separate issues. It is also, a lot of people think, well, if I forgive, that means I have to forget, but that's not true. Uh, that's a... Uh, that's a twisted um, philosophy on faith and, and psychology. But really, some people are so dangerous and so toxic. And so forgiving sometimes means remembering what they did. We don't have to forget. An ideal situation is that, yeah, you did something to me, but it's no big deal. And we just forget and move on. But there are some times when things are so bad that we can't forget. And we have to set boundaries to protect ourselves from being hurt again. So in other words, you can forgive and still get a restraining order. Right? Does that make sense? It is also not reconciling. Reconciling takes two parties in all sorts of conditions that are agreed upon. And uh, it might be that there's no way that you can reconcile because of what happened. And so forgiveness is a different issue than reconciliation. It is also different than justice and consequences. A lot of times we think, well, if I forgive them, I'm letting them off the hook. But really, justice is a separate issue. Sometimes uh, the consequences or the justice is the only thing that will cause a person to change their behavior. And so forgiveness is a complete separate issue from justice and consequences. Forgiveness is, however, always personal. It's always personal. Have you ever met um, sort of a disgruntled um, believer who doesn't... Uh, who, who just doesn't like the church, or they think the church in general is, you know, just bad news. They've been hurt, but, you know, so they say the church in general. But the truth is, is that somebody in that church, in a particular church, hurt them. 
It's the same way maybe in a company. And, you know, I hate, you know, ExxonMobil or whatever. Well, what do you mean you hate ExxonMobil? No, you hate someone or you have not forgiven someone in that organization. Forgiveness is always personal. Why is this important? Because in order for you to forgive, you have to identify and name the person who hurt you or caused you pain. It's very important. Forgiveness is always personal. And forgiveness is always a process. Always a process. You know, there are some times uh, where forgiveness is just instant. Right? Yeah, it's no big deal. I, for, I know some people like that. They really don't hold anything against anyone. They're just like, yeah, don't worry about it. I understand. But then there are some people who are here today that maybe have some pain and some hurt that has been going on for like 20 years or so. And so forgiveness sometimes is like a process. And so my prayer, my hope for you today is that if by the end of the day, you are not planning to torture and mutilate that person that hurt you, hey, progress, right? Sometimes it's process. And so where is your heart postured? So I'm going to take you to Judges 15 this morning. How many of you love to read through Judges? <laughs> I love Judges for a couple of reasons. Well, number one, the, the main reason is because Samson is in Judges, right? And Samson is my all-time favorite Bible character or Bible person, that, <laughs> person from the Bible. Um, and uh, anytime you read anything with Samson, it's basically like chronicles of testosterone. I mean... <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Samson had a, had a mullet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he drove a Camaro with the T-tops, you know, 1982 Camaro. I'm pretty sure that, that it, you know, he's, he's always carrying around his six-pack like Calvin all around Lone Star Tall Boys or something like that. When I think of Samson, this is the kind of guy I think of. So let's read. This is a real interesting story, and if you, if, you, if you pay attention, I think you'll get something out of this because it reflects a lot of our own lives. Later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. So immediately, we are sort of flung into this Canaanite Jerry Springer episode. You know, they're pretty sure there's going to be, I'm not sure, baby's daddy and stuff like that happening. Chairs are going to be flung around. And then he says, isn't her younger sister more attractive? What a terrible thing for her father. <laughs> Take her instead. And Samson said to them, this time. This time I have a right. How many of you have ever said that before? This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines, right? I don't get mad. I get even. So I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyard and olive groves, you know, like you do when you're mad at people. <laughs> you know, you cross me, I've got 300 foxes in my car. <laughs> I will tie them together and light them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be in some trouble. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, this is insane. He gave, his father-in-law gave his, his wife to his companion because he thought he was. And so he decides, well, I'm going to get even. Because they did this, I have the right now to catch a, how do you even catch 300 says, I mean, have you thought about this? I mean, you read the story. It's like, how did he catch 300? Did he just know where the fox's den were, where like 300 foxes are hanging out? Or was this like a period of time, you know, like years where he's capturing these foxes and storing them until he's got 300 exactly? I mean, you think about this. This is insane. Have you ever tried to tie foxes together? <laughs> I mean, I tried it once. They wouldn't let me, you know. I don't, no, I didn't try it. 
I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And, but he burned up their, their crops and their, their, their vineyards and their olive groves because he was making a statement because they had gods of harvest and a god of the olive grove. And so he was like making a religious statement and an economic statement uh, by destroying their prosperity. And so this is what happened after he did that in verse 6. When the Philistines asked who did this, they were told Samson, the Timonite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, but gosh, what a response. And Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, right? I mean, here's a guy who just tied 300 foxes together and destroyed all of their prosperity and every, all their crops. And, and he, since you've acted like this... I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. By the way, when do you know when you've had enough revenge? Is it when everyone is dead? Uh, when does the revenge stop? Or are you like, you, you know, you kill them and then you're like in the afterlife and you're like, I'm not satisfied, you know, I'm, I want to, I mean, I don't, but anyway, until he gets his Revenge, And so verse 8 says, he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Edom. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The people of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? Remember, the Philistines ruled over the Jews at that time. We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him... As he did us. How many of you are like that? Oh, you did that to me. You know, eye for an eye, right? Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? And he answered, I merely did to what they did to me. They said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So that's my turn. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. And the ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands, finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, you know, because they're just laying around, apparently. <laughs> yeah, fresh one, you know, you can't, you don't get those old and rotted ones. So he grabbed it, and he struck down a thousand men. My observations are this. That this started with a guy and a goat and a father in law. <laughs> and it ends with a thousand men being slaughtered with the jawbone of a donkey. Revenge always escalates. It starts with the rolling of the eyes in a business meeting. It starts J Romeo and Juliet. Um, there's a, you know, there was a, a feud that started between two families. You remember the two families? Yes, the Capulets and the Montagues. Cues. Right. You know how that started? <laughs> there's a little line when you're reading that story, and it says that an airy word was spoken. That's how it started. Just a little rolling of the eyes. And then this long-lasting feud begins. Revenge always escalates. Have you ever, like, moved into a neighborhood and you're wondering why the, this family doesn't talk to that family? And you find out, well, there's this long history of how their dog was barking at 3 a.m. So that family went out there and poisoned their dog. And, you know, so in response, they went and they killed their cat and things like that. Or maybe you've been to a family reunion and you've noticed, well, 
why doesn't that person ever talk to that person? And why is there so much tension? You find out, well, there's this long history of how much they, they dislike each other and, and, and why that is. I mean, it always escalates. The other thing is revenge always inflames. It kind of creates in, in, inside of us this inflated ego that says, this time I have the right. And so it's sort of like this, uh, this relational Pong. I rem- remember the game Pong. Atari. <laughs> Pong. Pong. <laughs> it goes back and forth and back and forth. And revenge always inflames and it always escalates. And there are two types of revenge. See if you can identify with either of these. There's active revenge. Active revenge is like, they said what about me? Well, let me tell you about them. You know, so you can pray for them the right way. (laughs) They struggle with, you know, that sort of thing. But anyway, you know, it's sort of like one of those things where, you know, they say something to you and you're like, you actively say, well, your mama, you know, something like that. And they... They slap you, you slap them back. I mean, you know, it's an active revenge. And then there's another kind. How many of you are active revengeness people? (laughs) Just nobody. There's another kind. There's passive revenge. And that's, uh, that's the one that says, I won't go after them, but I will withhold myself from them. And I will hope that something negative happens to them. And when something negative happens to them, I am going to seek. How many of you are passive? Some of you are like, I don't deal with revenge at all. I'm saved and washed in the blood. Uh, So when we're unable to, you know, the the problem is, is that passive revenge is one of those things that bottles up. And at some point it just destroys you. And so forgiveness begins, though, when we drop the, the jawbone and, and um, just walk away. It starts when we drop it instead of lashing out and slaughtering people. 1 Peter 2.23 says, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Do you know that God can take care of justice far better than we can? So, in other words, instead of putting people on our hook, we put them on God's hook. God, you know better than me. You know how to properly deal with this. So, God, here you go. And when we refuse to do that, it's like we're saying that uh, we're, we fail to entrust ourselves to God the way Jesus did. It's saying to God, you are in my seat. I mean, <laughs> I can picture that, right? Hey, God, you're in my seat. Uh, I know how to punish them because I know what they did to me. I know, the, I know the degree of pain and hurt that they have caused me. And so I want their teeth to be smashed in their mouths. And, you know, uh, that's the kind of justice that we want. But the problem is, is that leads to anxiety. Do you struggle with anxiety? I wonder if there's unforgiveness. Do you feel like you have a bound up heart? I wonder if there's unforgiveness. Are you still holding against someone? Are you still holding something against someone? Well, you don't know what they did. I know. It's hard. But scriptures tell us that we must forgive. Romans 12 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I'd rather him do that than me. And it not it funny how when it comes to others, we're like, get them, God, get them, punish them. You know, slap them around a little bit, teach them a lesson. But then when it comes to us, we're like, take your time, God, you know. And the truth is that when we forgive someone, we find out that, it's, that we're setting someone free. And it's actually us. Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. One of the last things that Jesus was thinking about before he died was forgiving people who have caused him pain and hurt and have even put him on a cross for death. Now that's hardcore. So perhaps you have been handed a profound wrong. What are you going to do with that profound wrong Someone has wronged you. Someone has created pain. Someone has created a wound. Are you going to hold it? Are you going to hold on to it? 
and just wait for your opportunity to throw it back? Or are you just going to absorb it and let God do the rest? Tim Keller said, there is an option, another option, however. You can forgive. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on another person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Yes, but it is the death that leads to resurrection. Actually, when you say resurrection in your preaching, you're supposed to say resurrection because it's just more powerful. So it's the death that leads to resurrection instead of the lifelong living death of bitterness and sin. You're not giving it any fuel, and so the resentment burns and lower. How many of you would say there's... Parker Palmer said, the cross says the pain stops here. The way of the cross is a way of absorbing pain, not passing it on. A way that transforms pain from destructive impulse into creative power. When Jesus accepted the cross, his death opened up a channel for the redeeming power of love. You know, simply put, you will find it necessary to let things go simply because they're too heavy. Who do you need to forgive? Are you holding a jawbone waiting to strike someone? You know, I'm not talking like literally. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Are you just, have you picked up the jawbone and just waiting to strike someone? You're just waiting to slaughter? Do you feel the weight of a wound, an offense? Is it affecting how you live your life? What do you need to put down and let go? Can you say today that the pain stops here? Are you willing to absorb the pain and take it out of circulation? It's important that we forgive. We talked about last week, Ephesians 4, that says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. We talked about this, you know, because unforgiveness is really, it's rooted in a demonic illusion. It feels empowering, but it's actually disempowering and destructive. By refusing to release a debt, you're surrendering the key to your own freedom, well-being over to the other. Colossians 3 says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. For some of us, the starting point of forgiveness is, how many of you have not forgiven yourself? You're like, why did I do that? Yeah, you know, I do that all the time. It's like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? And Ashley tells me, well, because you're an idiot. No, she doesn't tell me that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So we're, we're part of Vineyard Association. It's not a denomination, depending upon who you ask, right? Uh, but it, it really is an association that um, you can be a part of. As long as you share values, the same values, and not even really necessarily the same theology, but definitely the same values. So if caring for the poor is a value, um, that's a value of the vineyard. Uh, The Holy Spirit is a value of the vineyard. We value that. Worship is a value. We value worship. And there's some other um, uh, values that the vineyard shares. And so if you share that, uh, you can become part of this association and... um, there's no authority that the vineyard has over each ind- independent church, which is what we are. But what you're saying is that we're going to get in relationship with this, these other churches uh, around the country. And in, this, in the U.S., there's about 600 vineyard churches who are a part of that association. And you have to pay to be a part of it and to use the name. Well, a while back, um, I was really struggling. I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to be part of the vineyard. Um, I was really struggling, and um, we were like, you know, do we belong in the Vineyard Association? And I, don't, I, I couldn't figure out why I was so, um, what, what it was that I had against the Vineyard. Why in the world would I want to pull out of the Vineyard? And we share the same values and that sort of thing. And I kept going, I was like praying, God, where do, you, where do we belong? Where are we supposed to be? And, uh, and I realized that, that I had been hurt by some people in the vineyard. 
some actual people in the vineyard. And because of that, um, I just cast on the whole vineyard. Well, the whole vineyard is, you know, heartless, you know, that sort of thing. But it, it was the, the person who was inside the vineyard. And so we were praying and praying. And finally, I felt like, okay, I need, to, I need to really deal with this issue. And so, you know, I met with one of them and things and um, really dealt with the unforgiveness and resentment that was in my heart. And um, the cool thing is that as I was praying and stuff, I've been wrestling with this for probably... Uh, no. um, I was like, God, because you don't want to just be an end of church without oversight and accountability. And the, uh, we can do some crazy stuff without accountability. Um, and um, it was funny. <laughs> just last week uh, or this week, um, Ashley found a bag with our old, um, we had some, some old stuff in it, some old photos, like when I was in a car accident in 1994 and as some old um, money that from foreign money, different things like that, and some back. And inside of that was our, uh, we got married in Beeville, Texas. And what they do in Beeville, Texas, when you get married, it's a small southern town, yeah. But anyway, they, uh, they put you in the newspaper, you know, a, 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 wedding, a wedding announcement. And so they'll put your picture and they'll, you know, have like the wedding announcement in there and everything. And so we had cut that out and... Uh, out of the newspaper, and we put it in this bag. This was in, this was in 2002 when we got married. It was on April, April 20th, and uh, we didn't come to the vineyard till about 2005 or so. Um, so we've been in the vineyard for a long time, but prior to that, we didn't know anything about the vineyard churches. And um, so we found that picture, and I was looking at it. I was like, "Hey, you know, remember, look how young we look. <laughs> you know, we look like babies, and that sort of thing." How many of you do that? You pull out old. Pictures. I was like, I was telling the kids, look, we were famous. We were in the newspaper, you know, <laughs> celebrities, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it blew my mind uh, because God knows I had been wrestling with the vineyard for a long time. And, um, and I turned it around to see what was on the backside. And it said, the headline, vineyard, on the headline. And I thought, isn't that, isn't that something? What are the chances of that ever happening and I think at that moment I just settled in my heart you know that's what God has called us and um, are there things I disagree with yeah but that's our tribe Uh, but I was just blown away but I I felt like the Lord just set me free from that burden at the unforgiveness and resentment it just eats up your soul if you could take a spiritual x-ray of your heart, if you're, if you're holding on to um, resentment and unforgiveness, um, they would see that it's black. And so in the physical realm, if you had heart issues, wouldn't you think about that? How many of you had done, have done something about that? So in the spiritual realm, it's the same way. Do you want to be healthy? Do you want to live the life that God has intended you to live? One of the ways to step towards that is by forgiving. How do you release them from the pain they caused you? What are the things that you can, that will help you forgive someone? I think it's crazy, but the main thing that you can do, number one, if they are still alive, go to them and say out loud to them, I forgive you. And realize that it is not an emotional thing, but it is a spiritual. As many of you say, there's no way I can go to some person. I mean, that's one of the hardest things. Saying it out loud if they're no longer around. Just saying it out loud. There's something in our words. Do you remember what the scriptures teach us about our words? The words that we speak have the power to tear you down or build you up. The power of the words is like a rudder in a ship that can move you and to change the trajectory of your life. The words that you have, the power to create or the, or the power to destroy. And so I believe that there is power when we begin to speak forth forgiveness. Now the, the process begins in the, uh, starts in the heart and the, the mind and all of those things afterwards. But if you just act on saying, I forgive you, I think you'll see that your heart begins to change. Because how many of you know you can tell your, your mind what to do? 
Ashley tells me what to do all the time. Uh, so anyway, I, I want, before we leave, um, we did this last week, but there was some that weren't here last week. I want you to take a moment to, um, to just think about the people that you need to forgive. And um, while you're doing that, um, I would even encourage you to, um, to speak it out loud at uh, some point today. And if you can, call them and tell them. Uh, you can hold on to that all, as long as you want. But that's not what the Lord instructs us. This is Jesus actually your Lord. If Jesus is telling you to forgive, are you going? And if you're disobeying him, he's not your Lord. So let's just take a moment. Father, just ask that you, and that you reveal in our hearts and our minds the people that we are to forgive. Lord, I ask that you would set us free today. All right. How many of you have forgiven someone today? Anybody? Good, good. How many of you have decided I'm not going to forgive someone today? I don't care what you say. I ain't forgiven. Nope. <laughs> hey, my hands are clean. <laughs> I've given you the truth. <laughs> Let's stand. I want to speak a blessing over you before we go. And um, if... Um, if the Lord is just t tugging at your heart this morning about the whole forgiveness or unforgiveness thing and you need prayer for that, um, you'll just, you can just come down after the blessing and the, we pray. Or if you just want to come and spend time at the altar, um, business, um, that's cool too. Um, so um, either way is fine. Also, you may not know this. I don't know all of you here this morning. I don't know your stories. But, you know, Jesus came, the Father sent him to this earth because he wanted us to be set free, free from the oppressor of the world. He came to take away the sins. He was the sacrifice for our sins. And so we were forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. And sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that because we're such in a modern culture, in a modern era, that we don't get the idea that uh, back in those days, lots of animal sacrifice and human sacrifice and, uh, and all kinds of religious systems and, and God, in a way to show the world, said, I'm going to give the ultimate blood sacrifice. I'm going to send my only son. And with his sacrifice... I want to restore my children to myself. They're no longer going to be separate from me, but instead they're going to be allowed to be in my presence, to my throne room. Some of you may not realize that you've been forgiven already because of, and you've been feeling shame and you're feeling guilt and you think maybe God would never love you. But I'm here to tell you this morning God loves you so much that he gave his only that you would be saved not to condemn you but to save you and to give you a new way of living and a new life and maybe there's one or two or maybe none I don't know that have never accepted that as truth that you have never said I believe that that is true I know it in my heart that that is true, that Jesus died for me. And you have never said, I want Jesus Lord of my life. I want to change the way I'm living for his way. I want to be in eternity with him. And maybe you've never done that. So today I'm just going to ask if you close your eyes and bow your head, everyone in this place, because it's very personal moment if you would like to accept that as truth 
and just declare, you know, I want that. I want Jesus, that forgiveness. Just lift your hand up high so I could see it. There's a... And once you've done that, you just pray. Father, maybe you don't even recognize him as Father. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me, that you are the Son of God, that my sins have been forgiven because of your sacrifice. And so I'm declaring today that I'm yours. I exchange my ways for your way. My life is yours. And then from that moment, just allow direct your life to speak through you. Well, how does God speak all kinds of ways? Through people around you? Through scripture? Through activities? And I bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I bless you with the eyes to see what the Father is doing. I bless you with the ears to hear what the Father is saying. I bless you with the courage to follow him as he leads. I bless you with wholeness. I bless you with prosperity. I bless you with good health. May the Lord be with you all. Amen. Well, if you guys need to reflect or you need prayer, come up to the front and we'll make sure that you get some. Have a great week.